In welcoming you to this year's Boyle Lecture, I note that not since its revival have we held this lecture during Lent, although it is not intended that there should be anything additionally ascetical or rigorous about tonight's experience intellectually or socially. Yet as Rector, I'm reminded of W.H. Alden, who noted that when he found himself in the company of scientists, felt rather like a shabby curate who had strayed by mistake into a drawing room full of dukes. Just so. The novelist Edward St. Orvin comments that whereas London parks insist on nature, Central Park in New York is given up to recreation, notably exercise and diversion. Christian and Western popular responses to things natural have been diverse. The ancient bestiaries, which posited that all wildlife, however vicious yet created, must have something to teach us about God. The devotional books of ours, which saw in the passing months the pattern of our salvation. The picturesque and romantic movements, which variously tried to tame or liberate the aesthetic of the natural and influence the aesthetic of Christian worship and culture thereby. All have been well-intentioned. Today, Christians are prominent among those who press for an urgent response to climate change. But much of the writing seems to me to have limited weight because it fails to address Christology convincingly. But perhaps tonight's lecture will show me that that question hardly matters. The 215 lecturer is a member of the Boyle Advisory Board, the third time a member has offered a lecture to us, and revealing just how distinguished a group continues to guide this venture. His lecture will be available directly after tonight's proceedings as you leave, and I'm especially grateful to Gresham College and to its staff, warm supporters pretty much from the outset of this project for stepping in so that a recording may be available on their website and ours very shortly. The Worshipful Company of Mercers and the Bishop of London have offered support both purposeful and practical for which I record warm thanks. And the Worshipful Company of Grocers to whom the parish constantly owes much have been especially and thoughtfully generous this year. We are boundlessly grateful. To introduce the lecturer and responder, I have pleasure in handing over to the parish's friend and the, lecturer, the lecture's animator, Michael Byrne. Thank you, George. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of my colleagues on the board, I'm delighted to join with George in welcoming you to this, the 12th in the new series of Boyle Lectures. Our speaker this evening is someone who has been closely associated with the Boyles for at least the last five years. Dr. Russell Ray Manning is senior lecturer in philosophy and ethics at Bath Spa University and also a visiting fellow of St. Edmund's College, Cambridge. Among his many publications, he has edited both the Oxford Handbook of Natural Theology and the Cambridge Companion to Paul Tillich. Russell has also edited two books in the Barnes and Noble 30 Seconds series. His 30 Second Religion, published in 2011, has sold over 58,000 copies worldwide and been translated into seven languages. He has asked me particularly to say that it has just become available in this country at all good bookshops near to you. <laughs> Some of you may remember that our original intention was to have Professor Robert Russell from Berkeley in California give this year's lecture. Bob graciously accepted our invitation and all was going well until he developed a back problem some months ago that would possibly have prevented him from traveling. Sadly, he had to withdraw and we invited Russell Ray Manning to give this year's lecture instead. I'm happy to report that Bob Russell, all these Russells, is now back to robust good health 
and will be with us to give the 14th Boyle Lecture in 2017. To respond to our own Russell this evening, we have Dr. Louise Hickman, who is Senior Lecturer in Philosophy and Ethics at Newman University, Birmingham. We're very grateful to Louise for accepting our invitation, and we look forward to hearing her remarks later on. Russell Manning's lecture will look at the field of natural theology, a core interest for the Boyle Lectures, both in their original incarnation between 1692 and 1731 and today. Natural theology, which suggests that an examination of the world in which we live can tell us something of value about the God who created it, has enjoyed a checkered and at times controversial history in Christian theology. Russell will explore this and propose his own take on how a revised natural theology can still have considerable traction within the greatly modified scientific worldview in which we operate these days. These Boyle lectures try to bring together two complex disciplines. Science is not easy. Theology is not easy. And so we might expect that any attempt to look at the area where these two complex disciplines meet and overlap might be doubly difficult. It sometimes is, and these lectures can sometimes be a challenge to digest at one sitting. But to assist you, as George has said, in reflecting further on this evening's presentation, we will, as usual, be giving out a booklet which contains the full text of both Russell and Louise's remarks as you leave at the end of the lecture. Please do take one and read it through at your leisure. With that, I have great pleasure in inviting Dr. Russell Ray Manning to give the 2015 Boyle Lecture on Natural Theology Reconsidered Again. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Good evening. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, George. Thank you to all of the board of the board Boyle Lectures. And without lapsing into Eddie Redmayne territory, um, I'd like to thank the producers of LEMSIP, without whom this lecture would not have been written and would not have been delivered. I hope my voice will uh, last the 45 minutes. I'd also like to thank Bob Russell for his understanding and encouragement as I prepared to step into his shoes. I, for one, look forward to him being with us in 2017 to deliver his Boyle Lecture. This evening, I do not attempt to be Bob Russell He's a scientist, theologian. I am but a philosopher of religion. Just plain Russell will do for me. What we do have in common, however, is a shared interest and appreciation of the thought of the Lutheran German theologian and philosopher, Paul Tillich. 2015 is the 50th anniversary of Paul Tillich's death in Chicago in, in 1965. And it is with a word of warning from Tillich, from one of his sermons, that I begin. Tillich says, nothing is more dangerous for the theologian himself and more despicable to those whom he wants to convince than a theology of self-certainty. This evening, I propose to have another look at the very idea of natural theology, and more specifically, to reconsider the vexed question of its apparent demise and I shall also, by way of conclusion, say something of the future of natural theology, the prospects for which I think are far, far from as bleak as is commonly believed. In brief, my argument will be that neither what I shall call the traditional nor the revisionist accounts 
of the nature and fate of natural theology are adequate to the task of explaining the peculiar trajectory of its history, and in particular, the consensus view of its apparent terminal decline. To anticipate my main concern, I want to suggest that the fundamental reason behind the seeming eclipse of natural theology in the modern era is the increasing specialization of Christian theology in the attempts characteristic of the 19th and 20th centuries by theologians to establish an unambiguous subject matter for theology, either through the notion of faith or through that of revelation. It is, I propose, this quest for disciplinary purity that proved fatal for the inherently impure enterprise of natural theology, namely that of looking to nature to speak of God. The conviction of modern theology that it be primarily, indeed exclusively, about religion or about God's own self-revelation is, I propose, incompatible with the idea, crucial to the vibrancy of natural theology, that knowledge of God is not restricted to one specific domain, but is available in some form or another to all, simply on the basis of their experiences of the world in which they find themselves. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before setting out my more revisionist interpretation of, uh, of the question of the apparent rise and fall of natural theology and its epistemic authority, so, sorry, kind of academic term, epistemic authority, I just simply mean whether its claims to knowledge ought to be taken seriously or not. Before doing that, I want to stay, take a step back and say a few words about the origins of natural theology as a style of thinking, or perhaps better, as a way of seeing the world and the whispers of divinity therein. The fate of natural theology matters, I venture, because natural theology represents such a fundamental, dare I say, such a natural human attitude. Recent work drawing on cognitive science and evolutionary psychology, and don't worry, I'm not going to go into this in any great detail, confirms what my argument suggests, namely that natural theology and its central arguments have an intuitive appeal that is hard to resist, even if it is conceded that the, the arguments themselves lack persuasive power. Natural theological arguments rarely persuade as standalone, pure arguments. Instead, natural theological arguments seem to express intuitive convictions that the operations of human intellect and the ways the world seems to be to us as we encounter it are not merely self-contained, but rather tell us something however imprecise, uncertain, or incomplete about God. That such a basic human impulse is thwarted by the consensus orthodoxy of the illegitimacy of natural theology is, to say the least, a recipe for tragic alienation and an open invitation to all forms of dogmatism or sectarianism religious or otherwise. What I think this recent exciting work confirms is that natural theology is not and never should have become an independent type of theology, supposedly self-sufficient and wholly distinct from other forms of theology. Such a thought of the autonomy of natural theology is encouraged by standard approaches to the subject, approaches that start with a stark either-or opposition between natural and revealed theology. If we know anything about natural theology, it is that it is 
opposed to or different from revealed theology, I contend that that contrast has been especially harmful to the proper estimation of the character and ambition of natural theology. There is, so what I'm going to say now uh, has four main sections, and my first section deals with the traditional account of the nature of natural theology. There is a long-standing convention of defining natural theology against so-called revealed theology. This approach is typically developed in terms of the contrast between the two books, nature, the book of God's works, is a subject of natural theology. Whilst the book of God's words, scripture, is the subject of revealed theology. The two, the implication seems to be, are different disciplines with different source material and an autonomy one from the other. In Francis Bacon's words, one must not unwisely mingle or confound these two learnings together. This natural revealed contrast has firmly established itself as the established starting point for an understanding of the character of natural theology. It is, however, not a helpful point of departure. By contrast, an historical approach to defining natural theology suggests instead that natural theology is not, uh, sorry, natural theology is best defined not as a body of knowledge distinct from the systematic reflection upon revelation, but rather as an attitude or a way of thinking about the divine that can take its place alongside other approaches. The original definition of natural theology compares it not to revealed theology, but to two alternative types of theology, mythical and civil. Augustine reports this distinction, which he attributes to the first century BC Roman writer Marcus Terentius Varro. Although it's pretty clear that this is a distinction that Varro himself derives from a well-established Greek tradition. We don't have Varro's writings, so we don't know what he actually said. We have Augustine referring to Varro. You can sort of trust Augustine on this one. <laughs> Augustine cites Varro's description, I quote, they call one kind of theology fabulous, mythicon, and this is chiefly used by the poets. Another, natural, physicon, and this is chiefly used by the philosophers. Another, civil, civile, and this is what the people in various countries use. The first sort of theology is best adapted to the theater, ad theatrum, the second to the world, ad mundum, and the third to the state, ad urbem. Put the contrast slightly differently, we might identif identify the three types of theology described by Varro as indicating three alternative attitudes to the task of theology. The point of mythical theology is to tell stories of the gods. It has an educational function in preserving the narratives of a particular religious tradition. What is important to note here is that in spite of the creative and imaginative character of this poetic theology, its primary purpose is to retell or re-narrate an established or given set of stories. This is theology as repetition. By contrast, the purpose of civil theology is resolutely practical. <laughs> 
Its aim is to maintain the Pax Deorum, to ensure that the institutions of the state reflect their divine origins. Civil theology is political and moral theology. It is, as Hobbes put it, not philosophy, but law. As such, it is important to note that the primary concern of such a theology is with the secular, and its primary purpose is to regulate human affairs in accordance with an established religious tradition. Against both of these, so the mythic and the civil, against both of these, the aim of natural theology, the theology of the philosophers, is rather, in a sense, simply to be concerned about God. This concern or worry about God is, in an important sense, for its own sake. Natural theology is concerned about God simply because the attempt to think about God compels and invites free and unconstrained reflection. God is an irresistible problem for thought. At the same time, of course, this sense of natural theology is, in Varro's terms, best adapted to the world. God is of concern because the thought of God is unavoidable to the philosopher, or indeed anyone seeking to make sense of her world and her place in it. Such a natural theology is a culmination of the philosophical engagement with reality, an engagement that transcends reductive naturalism in the ventured hope that in the words of the Cambridge Platonist John Smith, I quote, the whole of this visible universe be whispering out the notions of deity. It's a lovely image of nature whispering out notions of deity. And yet, as Smith continues, we cannot understand it without some interpreter within namely human reason, or logos, that disclosive power that gives confidence to these speculations that whilst always risked and never firmly accomplished are nevertheless not in vain, but rather are transformative and in some sense redemptive. And yet, we should be wary of an over-hasty conclusion that what we're talking about here is pure human reason, unaided and autonomous. So, Varrow identifies these three types of theology. Mythic, the theology of the poets. Civil, the theology of the priests. Natural, the theology of the philosophers. I want here to suggest a fourth type. By want of a better term, I'm going to call this faithful theology. If I was sticking to the Greek, um, I'd have to call it pistic. Mm, doesn't, I mean, that's what the Greek is, but it doesn't quite sound as nice, does it? So, faithful theology. By this type, I mean to indicate what might be called a theology of the believers. It is, to follow Varro's formula, best adapted to the church, ad ecclesia. This theology is above all dogmatic and creedal. Its aim is to explicate the contents of a, a religious tradition. In contrast to the mythical type of theology, this is not simply repetition, but exegesis, best encapsulated in Anselm's famous formula, Faith seeking understanding. The key distinction I want to make between this faithful type of theology and that which Varro designates as natural lies, I think, in the goal of these respective approaches. Faithful theology takes as its starting point a certain definition of God and aims through its analyses to remain true to its initial assertion. Natural theology, by contrast, has no dogmatic starting point from which to begin. 
or which serves to constrain or contain its reflections. Instead, on this view, natural theology is better characterized as the search for a definition of God, a quest which it knows can never and will never be fulfilled. It doesn't quite work, but I'm tempted sometimes to think of this sort of natural theology as an inversion of Anselm's faith-seeking understanding, more an understanding-seeking faith. My central contention is that faithful theologies are, from the outset, undertaken on the basis of a commitment to a certain ecclesiology, rather than a commitment to revealed, as opposed to natural sources of their theology. Another way of putting this, and I apologize for um, referring to uh, incomprehensible German philosophers at this point, but um, it's a sort of professional hazard, I'm afraid. Um, Martin Heidegger, yeah, Heidegger characterizes this approach as positive theology, where the positum, what is given for theology, is not primarily revelation, but faith. Heidegger writes, I quote, theology itself is founded primarily by faith even though its statements and procedures of proof formally derive from free operation of reason. This is, of course, not to deny the philosophical sophistication or rigor of faithful theology. However, it is to suggest that this approach entails a significantly different estimation of the character and role of philosophy for theology. This is where I get into even more dangerous ground. At the risk of, it's easy to write this, at the risk of committing heresy, um, let me remind you of Bertram Russell. That woke some of you up at least. Bertram Russell, in his discussion of Aquinas in his history of Western philosophy, Russell says, and I quote, there is little of the true philosophic spirit in Aquinas. He does not, like the Platonic Socrates, set out to follow wherever the argument may lead. He is not engaged in an inquiry, the result of which it is impossible to know in advance. He knows before he begins to philosophize the truth. It is declared in the Catholic faith. The finding, this is still Russell, the finding of arguments for a conclusion given in advance is not philosophy but special pleading. Russell concludes that he cannot, therefore, feel that Aquinas deserves to be put on a level with the best philosophers of either Greece or of modern times. Russell is, of course, undoubtedly mistaken in his dismissive view of Aquinas and his engagement with philosophy as a kind of pick-and-mix exercise. He is also... I'm sure we would all agree, wrong in its denigration of Aquinas' philosophical acumen. But I think he does have an important point. Aquinas' starting point is not that of the Platonic Socrates, who begins in awe and wonder, knowing nothing, and whose philosophical journey culminates in the achievement of a natural theology of learned ignorance. Rather, Aquinas' is that of a faithful believer, whose sacra doctrina aims, quote, to treat all things under the aspect of God. Bertram Russell, sorry for adding an extra Russell into the mix here, anyway. Bertram Russell is correct in as much as it does seem that Aquinas and the Platonic Socrates do have different estimations of the scope and ambition of philosophy within theology. And this difference is, I think, I hope, partly explained by my distinction between faithful and natural theologies. So to my second main section, from the traditional to the revisionist histories of natural theology. Moving from Aquinas to the modern era, it is, I suggest, the fate of natural theology, sorry, the fate of modern theology, 
to have been increasingly dominated by my fourth type of theology, alone and to the exclusion of or any other. Indeed, if any type of theology is permitted, it is only on the condition that it be subordinated to the primacy of theology as faithful response. Exceptions, of course, prove the rule. And the recent interest in theopoetics may be a sign that the iron grip of theological positivism is loosening, as, hopefully, is the rise of revisionist proposals of natural, for natural theology. However, for such possibilities truly to be realized, I argue, we need a more revisionist interpretation of natural theology. So, when considering the history of natural theology, we have this widespread view of its rise in conjunction with the scientific revolution and its demise when, frankly, the science survives without it. Just as is the case in the science and religion debate more generally, we first have to deal here with a persistent, if patently false, traditional narrative of the inevitable waning of natural theology in the face of the unremitting progress of scientific naturalism and the atheism that is said to follow from it. According to such a Whiggish view of scientific progress at the expense of theological superstition, early modern natural theology emerged in the wake of the scientific revolution as a short-lived, misguided attempt to receive the new empirical sciences by religious believers naive to the full implications of the new science. Encapsulated in the famous remark attributed to Laplace, slowly but surely, the scientists simply had no need of that hypothesis, i.e. God, and thus the days of natural theology were always numbered. Inevitably, the hero of such an account is Charles Darwin, whose theory of evolution by natural selection provided the definitive re rebuke to the last lingering, wishful thinking, helpfully collated in William Paley's 1802 book, Natural Theology. Fortunately, this simplistic and clearly ideologically driven account has rightly been exposed as fraudulent, notably, of course, by our 2010 lecturer, John Hedley Brooke, even though, sadly, it persists in the public imagination. I do not here intend to recount the catalogue of this traditional view's deficiencies. Instead, I want to pay attention to one of the most influential revisionist accounts that aims to place the rise and fall of natural theology in a far more nuanced story of the origins of modern atheism and the eclipse of, natural, uh, of theological authority. I refer her to the work of the intellectual historian Michael Buckley, particularly his work uh, on the origins of modern atheism. Extremely influential book. In short, Buckley argues that early modern natural theology emerged as a deliberate attempt by Christian theologians to respond to what they perceived as the dangers of a putative atheism taking shape in the burgeoning natural philosophy, the new science. For Buckley, natural theology represents an attempt by Christian theologians to outflank any potential atheistic natural philosophy by taking it on, on its own terms. And, if you will, occupying and thereby neutralizing its distinctive epistemic authority. Fortunately, the irony of the story for Buckley is that precisely by aping the natural scientists, the theologians, in effect, abandoned their own particular native, if you will, grounds of authority. By adopting the norms and criteria of the natural philosophers, the theologians evacuated their own properly religious grounds 
of any authority. From such honest but misguided attempts to outplay the scientists at their own game, the legitimacy of distinctly theological argument was lost, and the modern situation of dethought atheism was born. For Buckley, the lesson is clear. Theology must abandon its aspiration to get the better of atheistic natural philosophy. Theology should have no desire to become scientific. Such a tactic is bound to fail. Theology just cannot become philosophy or science without ceasing to be theology. Like a cricket team endeavoring to prove their superiority over a rugby team by playing and obviously losing a game of rugby, so natural theology is, do is a doomed enterprise. So Bath has had some influence on me. Um, Instead, theologians ought to summon up the courage of their convictions and return unapologetically to their own indigenous roots, a task that has recently been taken up with gusto by the adherents of so-called radical orthodoxy. So much for the traditional and Buckley's revisionist account. I'm now going to turn to my own quote, more revisionist account. Far from the disciplinary purity envisaged by later definitions of natural theology, the natural theology, for example, of the original series of Boyle lectures, by no means stood in opposition to its supposed revealed or indeed poetic, civil, and faithful rivals, but rather frequently moved from one to the other without any noticeable anxiety. In some sense, indeed, it's questionable whether the natural theology typical of this period is, according to the analytic definition, in fact, natural theology at all. Instead, in their different ways, the original Boyle lecturers may rightly be considered as, I propose, the heyday of modern natural theology in their joyful promiscuity with regards to ways of thinking about God and in some of the rather radical conclusions that such speculations lead them to. What unites the Boyle lecturers, and it's interesting, if you look down the list the, even just the titles, the, say the first 20 Boyle lecturers, it's not what you'd expect. It's not all natural theology in the sense that we've come to think of it as, as opposed to revealed theology. Many of these lectures deal with topics in what we would think of as revealed theology. But what unites them, and what makes them, I think, exemplary instances of natural theology properly, considered, is their insistence upon the inadequacy of any particular essence of Christianity. Be that the experimental natural theology, uh, natural philosophy, or the book-learned scriptural and ecclesial traditions. What brought this strand of natural theology to its apparent end was not, I suggest, its inappropriate mimicking of the epistemic authority of the emergent natural sciences, but rather another different loss of nerve. Rather than holding fast to the plural and multidisciplinary vision of natural theology, the impurity of the discipline, panicked by the apparent threat of atheism, the rumors of which were greatly exaggerated in that period, as indeed we might say they are in any other, these theologians looked instead for certainty and for the single-minded security of an essentialist approach to theology that identified theology with systematic reflection upon religion or revelation. Natural theology appears to fail, in my view, because it got crowded out 
by those various quests for theological purity, with the result that it's only these exclusivist forms of natural theology, i.e. those that affirm precisely against the wider tradition that reason alone can suffice to provide knowledge of God, that are recognized and duly condemned as such. In other words, natural theology becomes reduced to those atypical forms that construe it as concerned with, as it were, epistemic access points to God, such that the persistence of the heirs to the broader tradition of natural theology as defined by Varro goes unrecognized. As such, Karl Barth, Karl Barth, of course, famously says, nine, no, to natural theology. Yeah? With an exclamation mark after it, in case you haven't got the point. Yeah? As such, Karl Barth's aversion to natural theology is well-founded. If the only legitimate form of natural theo of theology, sorry, the only legitimate form of theology is faithful theology, construed as a response to the clearly circumscribed positum of God's self-revelation in Christ, then understandably any claims to alternative sources of knowledge of God are to be resisted in the strongest possible terms. But my point is to, that simply that's not what natural theology has been. Karl Barth attacked a certain understanding of natural theology, but not natural theology per se. But before we disappear down the rabbit hole of German philosophical theology, and trust me, we could go further, <laughs> but I won't, um, I want to turn now to the question, the issue of the strange persistence of natural theology after its official demise. My fourth section. As you may have noticed throughout my lecture this evening, I've carefully qualified the language of the rise and fall of natural theology in the modern era. I want now to be explicit. I just do not accept that natural theology was fatally undermined. not a narrative of rise and fall. Nor, of course, do I accept that it in any sense originated with the scientific revolution. As a result of the consensus turn to theological positivism, natural theology was indeed sidelined. And yet, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, its epistemic authority remained largely intact. It was just no longer appealed to as the preferred option for the theologians. Instead, it became replaced by the rise and the institutional establishment of systematics or dogmatics as the truly theological discipline. What my former colleague in Aberdeen, John Webster, refers to as theological theology. Whilst marginalized, however, natural theology never really went away. But it continued to develop, frequently in surprising directions. One could think of the German idealists. I promise not to go down that rabbit hole, so I won't. But I'll just say Hegel, Schelling. Um, they do natural theology. They're not in concerned with science but they're concerned with what we can know and understand about God on the basis of our experience of the world in which we find ourselves. That there was so much more to, natural, to 19th century natural theology than our exclusive focus on Paley and the Bridgewater treatises, that deserves far greater recognition. It's recognized in the scholarship, but I don't think it's recognized more widely. Indeed, for example, John Henry Newman, his strident rejection of natural theology, he called it the religion of inferences that turns theology into evidences. Yeah? That 
objection is echoed by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who himself condemned Paley's misguided efforts to prove the existence and nature of God, even as he advanced his own form of natural theology as part and parcel of his wider project of reanimating the Christian imagination of his time. One further compelling example, I think, of the persistent yet transformed presence of natural theology well into the 20th century is that of Paul Tillich. And his radical reformulation of the very task of theology away from dogmatics and towards what he calls theology of culture. Whilst Tillich explicitly rejects any appeals to nature, his reticence is not a rejection of the logic and aspirations of natural theology, but instead a different view of how best to characterize the world in which we live and through which we can come to knowledge of God. For Tillich, simply put, the world that we experience is that of historical existence and not merely nature as given to us by the natural sciences. Hence, Tillich's call for a project of theology of culture in which claims about God are to be made through normative cultural interpretations and not only through systematic unpacking of doctrinal loci. In this sense, then, Tillich's theology of culture, even if it has little to do with arguments to prove the existence of God, indeed, that's an enterprise that Tillich found ridiculous, if not a little blasphemous, nonetheless is one of the most developed natural theologies of the 20th century. To conclude, the prospects for natural theology. In conclusion, I propose that it is with approaches consistent with Tillich's displacement or, if you will, like a relocation of theology from its essentialist positivism, from being about religion to being about everything else, including religion. It's there that the future of natural theology lies. As might be expected, I'm not convinced that the prospects for natural theology are most likely to be fulfilled by either of the two academic specialisms that most closely associate with the term. That's to say the philosophy of religion or the science and religion field. That's, this is, of course, not to say that there's nothing interesting and important going on in those areas. There is. But both, at least in their currently dominant forms, tend to adopt overly restrictive conceptions of natural theology that would surely hinder its future were, if it were only here that we looked for signs of hope. Philosophy of religion, especially in its majority Anglo-American analytic strands, operates with a radically constricted notion of natural theology that simply equates it with philosophical argument for the existence of God. And it, there's a um, recent book, The Blackwell, in, uh, Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology, edited by J.P. Moreland and William Lane Craig, and it is just simply uh, um, a, a list of the various arguments in analytic philosophy for the existence of God. It's a very narrow conception of, theolo of natural theology. And that does little, I think, to reinvigorate natural theology as the enterprise of contemplative speculation about God on the basis of our experience of the world we find ourselves in, unless, of course, we happen to be finding ourselves in a world of purely analytic philosophical argument, which hopefully we don't all find ourselves in. Likewise, the contemporary consensus in the academic field of science and religion offers little for the further enhancement of natural theology, albeit for different reasons. Increasingly, those working in science and religion seem committed to a view of natural theology that permits it a place 
but only on condition that it take its place securely within and subordinated to faithful theology. Both last year's Boyle Lecturer and next year's are, I suggest, typical of this tendency. Whilst they both have very different projects and different reasons to recall natural theology as part of their work, both Alistair McGrath and Sarah Coakley share a common insistence that any form of revived natural theology must be relocated within the orbit of systematic theology. A move that partly explains their shared conviction that any revived natural theology must be very different from its Enlightenment or Paleite ancestor. Sarah Coakley talks about unimpaling natural theology. What both overlook is precisely that the antiquated forms of natural theology that they reject were only ever a minority strand within the broader tradition of natural theology and indeed one of its least representative in terms of its nature and ambitions. So where might we look to discern indications for the future of natural theology. Following my earlier suggestion, I propose that it is to those whose work attempts to escape the exclusive dominance of faithful theology, not out of an impious iconoclasm, but rather out of, an, out of a desire to liberate theology from an overly restrictive dependence upon religion. To put this in more Talikian terms, I find promise for the future of natural theology in that work for which the reach of what he calls the theological circle is wider than any one particular religious tradition. And that indeed ranges across nature and culture without lapsing into mere description. Precisely what this will look like is, I'm afraid, the topic for another occasion. But one thing is clear, to me at least. The future of natural theology will be a cautious and humble attempt to give voice to the whisperings of divinity in the world. Such a natural theology aims to respond to what Peter Berger calls the rumors of angels that puts the lie to the claims to the self-sufficiency of the natural and at the same time to recall Tillich's warning from my epigraph, the disaster of a theology of self-certainty. It's on this admittedly vague, yet nonetheless, I hope, hopeful note, that I must conclude. It has been a great privilege for me to have been permitted to indulge in these speculations about the nature, state, and future of natural theology in such an appropriate setting. It has been an honor and I'm truly grateful both for the opportunity and for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Russell, and thank you, Lemsip, for an enriching and stimulating lecture. I have been inspired with great hope as to how natural theology might be reconsidered again, and also as to how such a reconsideration might reinvigorate both the science-religion conversation and also the philosophy of religion. In response, I would like to make just four short points. Firstly, the distinction between natural and faithful theology makes an astute framework with which to view the current climate of philosophical theology 
and the prospects for its future. Personally, I think a little heresy is good for the critical soul. And so I rather enjoyed being reminded of Bertrand Russell's assessment of Aquinas. I think Russell illustrated here precisely why there seems to be a certain malaise among philosophers of religion in recent years. His contrasting of the respective journeys of Aquinas and Socrates reminded me of John Cottingham's lament that the current state of analytic philosophy has become not so much an intrepid voyage of discovery, but rather more of a carefully planned cruise. We might say that both the faith, faithful theology on the one hand, and a philosophical approach that seeks to work from reason alone on the other, have sometimes paradoxically a tendency to relax on the deck lounges, cocktails in hand perhaps, side by side. Neither one can be called strict repetition, but both, as Russell helps us to see, are inclined to expound received definitions. His proposal for a reconsidered, or Russell's proposal for a reconsidered natural theology orientates us instead towards the more adventurous waters of learned ignorance, and it certainly puts pay to the suggestion that natural theology requires the evidence of the world around us to be used for the justification of the nature and existence of God. This leads me on to my second point. Russell's fourth category of faithful theology does a much needed demolition job on the dichotomy between natural and revealed theology. He demonstrates to us eloquently how Athens, if you like the city of reason, and Jerusalem, the city of revelation, are indeed not worlds apart. They make a tradition more akin to a sprawling conurbation replete with heavy traffic and an untanglable spaghetti junction. The trouble with Michael Buckley's reading of history is that it already assumes this dualism and thus can only entrench it, making the two theologies mutually exclusive and thereby aligning revelation with the faithfulness model. Russell is right that there is much in Buckley's narrative that does not fit the history of the late 17th and early 18th century so-called heyday of natural theology. And I heartily embrace his discerning proposal of a historical tack to rectify these misapprehensions. I would diverge somewhat from him, however, by taking a different historical approach. And this constitutes my third point this evening. I would like to see historical study do even more work to aid a reconsideration of natural theology. The historian Jonathan Israel has shown us that intellectual ideas are not mere epiphenomena or side effects, as some historians would have it, but rather they are vital for molding our political and social values. Israel calls for a new reformed intellectual history that promotes what he calls a dialectic of ideas and social reality. This immediately focuses our attention on the political and social context of these historical ideas. And it points us towards a deeper realization of their potency. If we turn to natural theology, we might consider just one example. If the cosmic craftsman model of God, together with the idea of creation as an engine or artisanal structure, was originally promoted 
in order to challenge natural begetting as the foundation for monarchy, and thereby the authority of fathers as derived from the authority of God, then we need to think about natural theology as an important theological response to what at the time was perceived to be damaging structures of hegemonic power. Israel's line of approach points us towards a deeper contextualization of theological ideas than Buckley allows. And I think this could be a vital tool for the imagining of a broader natural theology. I do not believe that we are forced to embrace relativism and or the death of God if we appreciate how much more fully our ways of theological thinking are culturally and contextually embedded. And I'm sure Russell himself would agree with me on this. I am drawn, therefore, to his conception of natural theology as an attitude or way of thinking about the divine. But I think there is room to develop further the dialectic that Israel calls for, especially with regard to the wider social and ethical context. Fourthly, I have a different but perhaps complementary vision of myth. The new avenues for natural theology that Russell identifies offer, I would like to suggest, a way to embed myth at the heart of natural theology. Mary Wollstonecraft, one woman who isn't usually but ought to be, I think, considered as an 18th century natural theologian, wondered why, when so many people say they love rural scenes, did she never see anybody else while she was out on her early morning rambles? Maybe, she mused, the supposed taste for the rural landscape is actually the product of poetry and romances, rather than a real perception of the beauties of nature. Robert McFarlane, more recently, has expressed a similar sentiment in his Mountains of the Mind, a history of our human fascination with climbing mountains, despite their obvious perils. Our very perception of their terrain is molded by our imagination and our emotional response. The language of myth is indispensable here, not in the sense of mere fanciful stories, but rather in the sense of imaginative symbols that are essential for the way we see the world. Natural theology as Russell so fittingly put it, as a way of seeing the world and the whispers of divinity therein, is typically suffused with myth. What is seen as beautiful or orderly and what we see as worthy of contemplation is shaped by our prior understanding of the world and, crucially, what we believe to be valuable. The natural theologians of the 17th and 18th centuries were concerned to defend an ethical conception of nature by promoting a symbolic image of a cosmos saturated in the telos of divine purpose and ethical value. And the Platonists before them were concerned to prioritize the contemplation of rather than control over the natural world. This was how Wollstonecraft could say that when she walked among the wonders of nature, she was accustomed to converse with her God. Russell has inspired me to believe, therefore, that the resourceful direction for natural theology that he has set before us contains many exciting possibilities. I might venture to suggest that natural theology can spin its own myth 
to challenge what have become the dominant myths of our own age, not least competitive individualism, inevitable violence, and the omniscience of scientism. Seen in this way, myth might then complement Russell's insightful account of natural theology as a fundamental human attitude. And natural theology might, to its advantage, be made considerably more impure. A commendable task that Russell has so adeptly shown us is very much to be desired. On that note, I should like to end, thanking Russell once again for his invigorating and thoughtful lecture. I am deeply enthused by what he has said here tonight, and I am led to have great hope for the future of natural theology. Thank you.